Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Foreign Press Center. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for accommodating us with the uh, schedule change as well. Um, we're very grateful to have three very distinguished briefers with us today to preview President Obama's travel to China and Laos. Uh, in the middle is uh, Daniel Crittenbrink, Senior Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council. On the far side is Christina Siegel Knowles, Special Assistant to the President for International Economics and NSC Senior Director for Global Economics and Finance. Uh, to my right side is uh, Daniel Russell, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. They will make opening statements in that order, and then I will moderate a question and answer session. We'll welcome our uh, guests from New York uh, as appropriate. With that, welcome to the Foreign Press Center, uh, Mr. Crittenbrink. Well, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Crittenbrink, Senior Director for Asia at the White House. It's a pleasure to be back here at the Foreign Press Center and to see so many of our friends here today. Um, uh, as was just announced, I'm going to briefly walk you through the President's uh, upcoming program for his trip to Asia, his 11th trip uh, to Asia. Uh, I'll try to situate his trip within our broader strategy. Then I'll turn to my colleague, Senior Director Christina Siegel Knowles, to talk about our goals in the context of the G20. And then uh, I'll ask my colleague, Assistant Secretary Danny Russell, to provide framing comments uh, on our overall strategy for the region. Then, of course, we'll open it up uh, to your questions. So um, the President will visit China and Laos during this, as I said, his 11th trip to Asia as President. He'll arrive in Hangzhou on the afternoon of September 3, and he will go directly into a bilateral program with President Xi Jinping. We expect that that program will carry into the evening. Uh, on September 4, the President uh, may have an opportunity to conduct bilateral engagements with some of his G20 counterparts before beginning the G20 program that afternoon. The G20 program will uh, run from September 4 through 5 in Hangzhou. And again, I'll let Christina address the specifics of our objectives there. Uh, the President will then fly to Laos on the evening of September 5. On September 6, the President will meet with Lao President Bunyang and attend a state luncheon that the President will graciously hold in President Obama's honor. Um, later in the day, uh, President Obama will deliver a speech about U.S. Lao relations and uh, his rebalance strategy to the Asia Pacific. On September 7, the President will participate in the Waisili Summit and attend an event to highlight our partnership to address unexploded, unexploded ordinance in Laos. And in the evening, he will attend the East Asia Summit Gala Dinner. Um, finally, on September 8, the President looks forward to participating in the U.S. ASEAN Summit and the East Asia Summit. Uh, I expect the President will hold uh, a press conference at the end of the day to sum up the trip. Um, I also expect that the President will conduct some bilateral meetings over the next, uh, th uh, uh, over those three days while in Laos as well. L let me say just a couple of comments about the overall context for the visit. I think that uh, the, the President's uh, trip to Asia Again, his 11th trip and what we anticipate uh, will be his final trip to Asia as president represents uh, yet another important element of our high-tempo engagement with Asia in 2016. Just this year, the president hosted all 10 ASEAN leaders at Sunnylands. He uh, conducted a historic trip to Vietnam and Japan. He hosted Prime Minister, Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long. Uh, in Washington for an official state visit, and he will host uh, uh, Burma State Councilor Aung San Suu Kyi later in September. Uh, in addition, uh, he's been in regular contact with the, his Asian counterparts through phone calls, letters, and meetings on the margins of multilateral meetings, including the Nuclear Security Summit uh, this spring. I think the tempo of engagement um, reflects the President's commitment to uh, advance his rebalance strategy. Under the President's leadership, the U.S. is investing in the Asia-Pacific in an unprecedented way. We're strengthening our cooperation with and among partners throughout the region. We're leading efforts to enhance security, expand prosperity, and reinforce a rules-based order, as well as advance human dignity. We advance these objectives through cooperation with treaty allies, deepen relations with emerging powers, and active participation in regional institutions. And all of these elements will be on display during the upcoming trip. Let me say just a couple of words about the bilateral meeting with President Xi Jinping. During his visit to China, uh, President Obama will have an extended bilateral meeting with President Xi. This will be their eighth face-to-face -face meeting and their fourth extended bilateral meeting, building on their extended exchanges at Sunnylands, President Obama's state visit to Beijing in November 2014, and President Xi's state visit, of course, to the United States last September. The high frequency of leaders-level engagement with Chinese counterparts has been a deliberate part of our strategy 
for building a more constructive and productive relationship with China. Leaders level engagement is where problems get solved, where important business gets done, and agreements on cooperation are reached. We believe our methodical and consistent approach to China has yield, yielded a demonstrable record of progress on our priority issues. Over the past eight years, our work with China has played a major role in supporting global economic growth, preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, reaching the Paris Climate Agreement, ending the Ebola epidemic in Africa, supporting reconciliation efforts in Afghanistan, and strengthening nuclear security worldwide. In all these areas, the United States and China have worked to rally international efforts around a common purpose. Um, during this period, we've also more than doubled U.S. exports to China. We've attracted more than a tenfold increase in Chinese investment to the U.S. We've tripled the number of Chinese students studying in the United States. We've mo also more than tripled the number of visas being extended to Chinese travelers since 2009. We've also been reducing risks of incidents between uh, our militaries. We put in place mutually agreed rules of behavior for naval and air operations and established active channels of communication to better manage risk. Cumulatively, this progress has strengthened the foundation of the U.S.-China bilateral relationship. It's allowed space for us to candidly and directly address our differences as well, without having those uh, differences define the overall relationship. I can say with confidence that both governments and both leaders uh, have grown increasingly comfortable with being exceptionally candid with one another in confronting our differences and areas of friction, whether on human rights and religious freedom, treatment of civil society, maritime issues, unfair economic practices, or cyber issues, we obviously have real differences with China. We don't paper over them. We don't pull punches in addressing them. Both sides are committed to constructively managing those differences, even as we continue to work to expand practical cooperation. So that will be the spirit, I think, in which the meeting between President Obama and President Xi in Hangzhou will be conducted. Um, I think the President will make clear, as he has in the past, that the U.S. welcomes a rising China that is peaceful, stable, and prosperous, and that is a responsible player in global affairs. The President will make clear his view that when China is invested in helping to resolve regional and global problems, the United States and the world benefits. At the same time, the President will emphasize all countries need to play by the same rules, regardless of size or power, because that's the way everyone can compete and be treated equally. He'll also affirm that we believe countries are better able to reach their full potential when they protect the universal rights of all of their citizens. The President will also underscore our determination to ensure there's a level playing field for U.S. firms in China. Um, so in sum, I, I think the focus of that discussion will be, again, on narrowing differences, managing them, and expanding practical cooperation. And I'll leave, of course, discussion at the G20 uh, to Christina. Let, let me say just a couple of things, if I could, about our objectives in Laos and at the East Asia Summit. First of all, regarding Laos, the President's trip will be the first by a United States President to Laos. It's an opportunity to highlight the growing opportunities in U.S.-Lao relations. We've been working with the Lao government to expand cooperation on a broad range of issues, including building trade and economic ties, science and technology, education and training, environment and health, legacy of war issues, and humanitarian cooperation. We're committed to being a reliable partner for Laos and building a practical partnership that's based on common interests and mutual respect. Through our growing bilateral relationship, we'll continue to address directly our shared and oftentimes difficult history. Humanitarian cooperation, particularly achieving the fullest possible accounting of Americans missing from past conflicts, has built trust and is a clear demonstration of Laos's commitment to build a stronger bilateral relationship and it will continue to obviously be a top priority for the United States government. We also understand the importance of building trust by addressing legacies of war, particularly unexploded ordnance removal. Over the past two decades, the United States has invested over $100 million in Laos in UXO assistance. We hope to build on that commitment during the President's trip. We also want to build a foundation for the future. Our assistance priorities, in addition to UXO, are focused on education, health, and nutrition. On, on the economic front, we're pleased to, we were pleased to be able to sign a trade and investment framework agreement earlier this year, right after Sunnylands. We expect the President's trip will highlight further opportunities for trade and investment in Laos. And finally, on the uh, U.S. ASEAN Summit and East Asia Summit, I would say at the U.S. ASEAN Summit, 
President is looking forward to sustaining the, minimum, the momentum that we generated at Sunnylands in February by expanding our cooperation with ASEAN across our five priority areas. The President will describe new investments that we're making under U.S. ASEAN Connect, which is our overarching initiative to strengthen U.S. economic engagement with ASEAN. And, of course, the President looks forward to coordinating with ASEAN leaders on the way forward on important regional issues such as the South China Sea especially the need to keep the region focused on peacefully resolving disputes in accordance with international law, lowering tensions and invigorating diplomacy. At the East Asia Summit, the President will, of course, coordinate with leaders on efforts to advance a rules-based order in East Asia, in, in the Asia Pacific, and he will focus discussion on uh, a number of priority issues, including North Korea's illicit weapons, weapons and nuclear programs, uh, South China Sea disputes and issues such as human trafficking and irregular migration. Thank you for your patience. That's my overview of the President's trip. Now, if I could, turn it over to Christina to talk about the G20. Sure. Thanks, Dan. As Dan said, on September 4th and 5th, the President will participate in his 10th and final G20 meeting. I think to put this event in perspective, it's helpful to look back at where the world economy was when the President participated in his first G20 meeting in April 2009. In that month alone, the United States lost 800,000 jobs. Many of our economic indicators, the stock market, was on a trajectory that looked like it could be a repeat of 1929. In fact, many of the indicators were worse. And at the time, the G20 had only met at a leader's level once in the past. The world needed a place where the, world, the leaders of the world's economies could get together and discuss coordinated actions to respond to the global financial crisis. And so in that context, the President decided to elevate the G20 as the premier forum for international cooperation um, among major economies. At the time, the G20 delivered. It proved that, it, that through international cooperation we can um, produce real results. It helped to mobilize trillions of dollars in global fiscal support. It expanded the resources of the international financial institutions by a trillion dollars. And it also started to put in place some of the safeguards, some of the financial regulations that, that could help to prevent crises like this from occurring again. However, as we look to the President's final G20 summit, it's clear that the work of the G20 is not done around the world, too many people don't feel like the global economy is working for them. There's a sense of economic insecurity. And so the President will use his final G20 summit to really press for, um, for the G20 to take a key role going forward in ensuring that the global economy delivers for families and workers. He will specifically engage with leaders of other major economies on how to strengthen the global recovery and to ensure the benefits of globalization, digitalization, and integration are shared more broadly. In particular, he will engage on ways to ensure that the G20 economies are upholding high standards, protecting workers, and ensuring a level playing field, and expanding opportunity. I think in that context, the President looks forward to a G20 leader summit that will offer a number of opportunities to achieve tangible results that will make a difference in the lives of people around the world. And it will be an important capstone for the Obama administration um, and very much in line with the objectives that we have had in the Asia rebalance. Uh, I'm looking forward to participating in a successful summit. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Christina. Christina began by referencing the first G20 meeting in early 2009. And a few months later in that same year, President Obama's first year in office, he also took a trip to Asia. He visited Southeast Asia, uh, Singapore. He had a multilateral meeting in the region, uh, APEC. And he also visited Northeast Asia, including China. So for a guy like me who's been working Asia policy for the last seven and a half years, uh, this trip is a big deal. And it is, in many respects, really bringing full circle and tying together uh, the investments and the accomplishments uh, throughout President Obama's two terms. But I think more importantly, it is doing a lot, it will do a lot to cement the foundation for constructive relations among the countries of the Asia Pacific. And I, for one, believe that this will come to be viewed as uh, the most sub significant updating of the regional order that we have seen probably since uh, the Second World War. 
it's absolutely true that there's unfinished business uh, ratifying TPP, building on the law of the sea tribunal decision to find a peaceful, lawful balance among balance of interests among the claimants that protects the rights of all the parties, that protects freedom of navigation, unimpeded lawful commerce. There's unfinished business in connection with uh, human rights and uh, creating strong democratic institutions. Uh, with respect to expanding the capacity of countries in the region to combat transnational threats, whether it's terrorism and violent extremism or human trafficking and unregulated illegal fishing, and to safeguard themselves against uh, coercion. Um, but we're working on all these things, and we're working on these things in each of the components of President Obama's upcoming uh, trip. and. I think the framework for cooperation on these and other issues have been established in a way that cements an important role for the United States in the life of the Asia-Pacific region and locks in important benefits for American economic and security interests. So first and foremost in terms of our relationship with China, I think it shows the extent to which we've established a very strong foundation in the U.S.-China relationship that can both handle stress and can get things done, things that are meaningful to both of us. And you'll see that in, as uh, Dan just described, uh, the candid, authentic, uh, direct dialogue between our leaders. Uh, you see it in the strong institutional mechanisms that we have uh, developed and advanced, whether it's the strategic and economic dialogue or others. Uh, and you see it in progress in the many areas that uh, Dan alluded to where we have uh, made important uh, headway working together collaboratively. And there are areas as well where we may not be in perfect agreement, but where we can and have in many cases uh, found ways to uh, build significant convergence in our views, whether it's on the DPRK and the important uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2270 and our work on nonproliferation, or whether it's on cyber or development or counter-narcotics or counterterrorism, law enforcement in APEC. And there, are, of course, are areas, some of which Dan alluded to, uh, like behavior with regard to maritime uh, disputes in the South China Sea or the East China Sea, uh, the treatment of foreign NGOs, reporters, business people, companies, academics, the constriction of sp political space, uh, crackdown on civil society, areas where there is friction. But uh, we are trying to find ways to work things through. Uh, between us. Secondly, in the, uh, in the next leg of the trip, um, I think you'll see the demonstration of the improvement and in many cases the transformation of the United States' relationship with uh, so many countries, nearly all of the countries in the region. That includes Burma, that includes Vietnam, that now includes Laos. North Korea, frankly, is the only real outlier in that respect. And when you look at Laos, uh, what you see is that uh, we're dealing, in the first instance, directly and honestly, constructively with the past. Uh, we're facing up to the legacy of war and working hard on remediation and on uh, rehabilitation for uh, the affected people in the Lao PDR were very focused on the present and the TIFA agreement that Dan alluded to is a great example of that. The support that the U.S. is providing for Laos's chairmanship of ASEAN is another. And most of all, we're focused on the future and whether it is in the people-to-people -people programs, the nutrition, child nutrition, maternal nutrition programs, health education, our Lower Mekong Initiative, food security, water security, or importantly, Waisili, the Young Southeast Asia Leaders Initiative, something that you will 
uh, see highlighted in the President's trip and that will be, I think, a uh, growing and, and powerful legacy uh, of the rebalance, uh, a determination to uh, support the development of the people of the Lao PDR in a way that serves uh, everyone's interests. I've been there uh, quite a few times already this year uh, by myself with uh, Secretary Kerry and with others. Um, it comes through very loud and clear to me that the, uh, the people in the government of the Lao PDR welcome a robust and constructive relationship with the United States. Uh, we felt that vividly uh, in Sunnylands at the ASEAN leaders meeting. I certainly felt it uh, in Secretary Kerry's two visits to Laos already this year, and I am confident it's going to be visible uh, during President Obama's visit. Thirdly, in the Lao PDR, of course, we're going to engage with ASEAN. And I think that sustained engagement with, the United, with ASEAN has won the U.S. Uh, significant influence, a lot of friends. It's helped them uh, promote ASEAN unity and centrality, sometimes in the face of real difficulty and pressure. It's, uh, we've supported them as they've tackled some uh, tough issues. We've also helped ASEAN to build the East Asia Summit into an, an important platform to grapple with the big strategic issues. And look, that's a long-term project. But since President Obama's very first participation in the East Asia Summit back in 2011 in Bali, we have seen this forum come a long, long way in addressing real issues, real issues like terrorism and so on. So we expect this year the East Asia Summit to allow the leaders to center their discussions on uh, issues like maritime security, the South China Sea, the implications of the decision by the Law of the Sea Tribunal. Our position on this set of issues has been eminently consistent. And we continue to counsel uh, restraint and care and prudence. At the same time, we recognize that the Tribunal's decision is binding on the parties. And as we urge that the issues be managed and dealt with according to international law and peaceful diplomacy, the leaders will engage on the DPRK, as Dan said, and on nonproliferation. And the uh, submarine uh, launch of a ballistic missile by the DPRK in direct violation of international law and its obligations under UN Security Council resolutions, as well as the spate of missile launches that preceded it, makes this conversation all the more urgent. Uh, th this behavior, among other things, threatens civil aviation and maritime commerce in the region. And it's necessary for the leaders to, uh, to engage very directly on that real threat. Refugees, uh, migrants, trafficking in persons is an issue that is on the minds of the leaders and on the agenda of the East Asia Summit. The global humanitarian system is under tremendous strain, as the President and Secretary Kerry have pointed out. The needs are stripped the resources, and the EAS discussion of this set of issues will help set the stage for the important summits uh, to come later in the month in the UN General Assembly. And countering ISIL and countering violent extremism and that false narrative is a major concern to the member countries in EAS and the U.S. and our partners, including in ASEAN, are collaborating in a number of ways, including on aviation and border security, on the Counter Messaging Center, which uh, is being hosted by Malaysia and is now, I'm glad to say, up and running. And lastly, on the other meeting between President Obama and the 10 uh, ASEAN leaders, the second in 2016. Um, as Dan said, of course, we will be building on the uh, strategic partnership uh, based on the principles reached at Sunnylands. 
Uh, we'll also be really drilling down and rolling out in more, with more specificity uh, the launch of the U.S. ASEAN Connect initiative. So we have centers in Jakarta, in Singapore, and Hanoi. The U.S. ASEAN Connect uh, helps focus and helps bring together uh, private industry uh, in areas like Renew renewable energy, digital economy and innovation, women's entrepreneurship, and credit uh, facilitation. I think that uh, the CONNECT initiative reflects both the government's uh, but also the U.S. private sector's interest in supporting ASEAN's continued economic integration and the success of the uh, ASEAN economic community. The, the one brief additional comment I would make about ASEAN is that when you take a step back it is nothing short of extraordinary that a region as diverse as the 10 ASEAN countries, as burdened by the history of conflict and mistrust, as divided among uh, the world's great uh, religions and divided as they are along ethnic uh, lines, as complicated as their uh, geography is, uh, the fact that these 10 countries have found a way to uh, organize themselves and to create a mechanism that allows them peacefully to uh, engage on a range of economic, uh, political, social, and other issues creates a phenomenal opportunity that President Obama has made it a point to uh, recognize and to work from. And I think that it's very fitting that uh, his last visit to Asia will culminate uh, in a meeting with uh, the ASEAN leaders. Thanks. Thank you. So we'll have time for a few questions now. Uh, please identify yourselves and your outlet. Uh, if our colleagues in New York uh, want to step up to the podium, we'd, we'd welcome them. Let's start uh, on the black shirt, please. Uh, my name is Ung Kao Suk Suban. I'm from Laos. I'm working for Radio Free Asia. I have three questions to ask you. Uh, the first question, uh, uh, what are the prioritized work points that the Laos and government, Laos and U.S. have agreed to do together during the ASEAN summit? The second is that uh, U.S. have helped Laos to clear the UXO. It means uh, the world legacy. But I haven't heard U.S. talk about the clear uh, Agent Orange because the U.S. helped allow only the UXO clearance, but what about the Agent Orange? And the third question is that uh, I heard that um, uh, you talk about the cooperation between China and U.S. regarding to the human rights issue, but I haven't heard that uh, Laos and U.S. So what can be done to resolve the human rights violation in Laos? Because as we know that uh, there is no development on the human rights practice in Laos. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we hope to be able to uh, announce some uh, progress and some deliverables in the bilateral sphere as well as uh, uh, to demonstrate uh, the close cooperation between uh, the U.S. and the Lao PDR as the Lao chair uh, ASEAN. And I think that the record of the Sunnylands uh, leaders meeting augurs very, very well for that, particularly in as much as the then foreign minister, Minister Tonglun, has now been elevated to the position of uh, prime minister and will be chairing the uh, ASEAN meetings. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, a big focus of the discussion in the U.S. ASEAN meeting, which is what you asked about, will center around the U.S. ASEAN Connect initiative. And I think that goes to the heart of what uh, the uh, government of the Lao PDR has underscored is important to them, which is help uh, from the United States in closing the development gap. Now, we have uh, long-standing programs in support of the efforts to deal with the problem of unexploded ordinance in Laos, as you mentioned. This is a, a very serious problem that uh, takes lives and limbs every year, 
and we are looking to uh, bolster those efforts in a significant way uh, as an outgrowth of President Obama's visit. Uh, dioxin remediation is another dimension of our efforts to deal with the legacy of the war and the after effects of that very fraught uh, period. And it's folded into a broader set of initiatives whereby the United States seeks to support in a number of ways uh, the pr development and promotion of health uh, throughout uh, the Lao PDR, uh, including and particularly for children in as much as uh, stunting in Laos is a, a particular problem. With respect to human rights, uh, this is a part of the agenda in every conversation that uh, President Obama holds uh, with uh, foreign partners, as well as uh, important priority for Secretary Kerry and other members of the cabinet. Uh, I accompanied Secretary Kerry, as I mentioned, to uh, the Lao PDR early in the year in February and again in July. In his bilateral meetings, the Secretary was uh, very clear about the importance that uh, the United States and the international community put on respect for human dignity, respect for human rights. Uh, Secretary Kerry raised uh, specific points and uh, he, I, and our ambassador to uh, the Lao PDR make it a point to engage actively with civil society. I have no doubt uh, that President Obama uh, himself will, of course, engage directly with the Lao uh, senior officials on this important uh, topic, make clear that as our development programs already undertake to do, that we seek to uh, help uh, improve and strengthen the institutions that uh, protect the rights of all citizens of uh, the country. Um, and also, I can virtually guarantee that when you watch the video of President Obama engaging with young leaders representing uh, every corner of ASEAN and every corner of the Lao PDR, uh, you will hear from him the same uplifting and inspirational message that he conveys uh, to young people everywhere that he goes. Thank you, Danny. I agree with everything Danny said. Can I just make two general points to supplement what, what Danny just said? I uh, completely agree with Danny. I'm confident that the President will raise issues related to human rights and the importance of a free and vibrant civil society while he's in Laos. Uh, the promotion of universal human rights remains a central element of American foreign policy and we continue to demonstrate that every day and I know just recently Ambassador Susan Rice hosted uh, at the White House a number of uh, civil society activists from uh, across Southeast Asia just to demonstrate that fact again. And so uh, I completely agree with Danny. I, I think you'll see those issues emphasized on the ground in Laos as well. I also wanted to underscore what Danny said about the importance of our cooperation with Laos in the context of the East Asia Summit. I think we're going to build on our positive experience at Sunnylands. Even though there's been a leadership transition in Laos since then, I think we're very encouraged by the way uh, our two countries work together for a successful Sunnylands outcome. And I'm confident that we'll continue to work together for a successful East Asia Summit, which will focus on a, a whole range of important uh, regional strategic issues from issues like maritime issues, the Korean Peninsula, but also including things like human trafficking and irregular migration. Thank you. Uh, let's go to uh, Jen in the green jacket, and then we'll go to our colleague in New York. Please keep your questions as brief as possible so we can get more uh, opportunities. Thank you very much. I'm Jennifer Chen with Shenzhen Media Group, China. I would like to know what will be the optimum outcome of a bilateral meeting with, um, between President Xi and President Obama, especially in regards to the South China Sea dispute. And during his meeting with Susan Rice, President Xi stated that China does not plan to challenge U.S. hegemony. Might this encourage the U.S. to decrease its involvement in China's global interactions? Thank you very much. Could you repeat the last part? Might this uh, uh, cause the United might States Might this to... encourage U.S. to decrease its involvement in China's global interactions? 
Well, uh, I'll take an initial stab at your question. First of all, uh, thanks very much. Uh, as I mentioned, um, um, the President very much looks forward to his eighth meeting with President Xi Jinping. What, what I think you'll see both as an outcome of the meeting and I think in the, in the content of the meeting itself is a very broad-ranging discussion between two leaders that are committed to advancing cooperation everywhere we can on a range of global issues from global warming and climate change to counterterrorism um, to uh, furthering our non-proliferation goals to taking steps to uh, strengthen uh, the global economy. And, and I think you'll see that very clearly uh, through the readouts of the meetings and hopefully from uh, the deliverables that are announced uh, after the meeting. But at the same time, uh, I'm confident that our two leaders will, just as they've done before, just as I saw them do uh, at Blair House last year and on the margins of the Nuclear Security Summit here. I'm confident they'll have a broad-ranging strategic discussion about uh, how we approach one another, what our priorities are internationally and domestically, and importantly, not just on the areas where we cooperate, but how is it that we're going to manage our differences, our very real differences over issues like uh, maritime issues, like cyber. Um, like human rights. And, and I'm confident that the President will have an opportunity uh, to explain what drives uh, American foreign policy, what our objectives are, and, and what we hope to see um, in our interactions with the Chinese. You asked what would an optimal outcome be on the South China Sea. Our policy on the South China Sea is clear. We want all countries um, to advance their claims and operate uh, in accordance with international law to commit to resolving disputes peacefully um, and to ensuring that freedom of navigation, uh, unimpeded commerce um, uh, are, are always protected. And so that's the optimal uh, outcome uh, that we seek. And I'm confident that there will be a very uh, clear and candid exchange uh, between our leaders on those issues. You, you mentioned a final uh, uh, comment. Uh, let me just answer it this way. Uh, I thought that Ambassador Susan Rice had a very uh, productive and constructive series of meetings during her recent trip um, to Beijing. Uh, I thought her meeting with President Xi was particularly uh, fruitful. And uh, the message that I took away from the quote that you mentioned from President Xi was that China is trying to make clear that it is not out to challenge the United States. Similarly, President Obama Ambassador Rice and other senior leaders have made very clear uh, we do not seek to contain China. We do not seek a confrontational relationship with China. Rather, we seek the most constructive and productive relationship with China possible, even as we continue to manage uh, the many differences between us. Uh, I don't know if either Danny or Christina would like to add anything to that, but that's uh, my response to your question. Thank you. Okay, let's go to New York, please. Thanks for the question. Uh, the U.S. ASEAN Connect initiative is a, a mechanism that is aimed at facilitating the communication between uh, the U.S. private sector uh, in the first instance and projects and opportunities in uh, the 10 ASEAN countries uh, and to the extent possible vice versa. What we're finding is that uh, notwithstanding the uh, formation of the ASEAN Economic Community and uh, notwithstanding the great progress that's been made on ASEAN connectivity and centrality, the fact is that each of the 10 ASEAN countries often operate independently and that it presents challenges for uh, U.S. businesses who want to contribute to the uh, market in Southeast Asia, which is a huge and growing uh, market, and who also want to harness uh, that energy uh, in their business in the United States as well. 
So in the initial stages, we are uh, augmenting our uh, embassy staff with uh, well-trained uh, economic uh, specialists who can uh, help with the matchmaking in these areas of focus that I mentioned. And the uh, countries that are positioned uh, well to create opportunities for U.S. investors and for U.S. businesses uh, are the countries that will, in the first instance, uh, make the most of the U.S. ASEAN Connect, but we're undertaking it in all ten uh, countries. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Andre, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrei Sitov. I'm a Russian reporter with TASS, the Russian news agency. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, doing this, and uh, thanks to our friends at the FPC for hosting this. Uh, I obviously look uh, at your upcoming visit to uh, China and uh, to the region in a trilateral way. Uh, U.S., uh, Russia, and China. So well, my first question is about the American uh, Chinese side of that uh, trilateral relationship and uh, the question very simply is how do you define that? How do you define uh, China for yourself? Is it a rival, a partner, or is it moving closer to being a partner or a rival? And, and then secondly, uh, if you look at the whole triangle, then which side of the triangle is the strongest at this point and why? Thanks. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to take the, the first part. Um, I'm not quite sure how to comment on the, the triangle question. Um, how, how to define China? I, look, I, I think our relationship with China is uh, exceptionally important, one of the world's most consequential. It's also one of the world's most complex bilateral relationship. I think it defies easy and simple in definition, definitions. So uh, as I said a moment ago, when we seek to describe the U.S.-China relationship that we seek to build, uh, I mentioned that we strive for a constructive, positive relationship with China where we expand uh, our cooperation on a, a number of shared global challenges. Uh, at the same time, we recognize and are comfortable with the fact that there uh, exists a broad range of tensions in the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, we don't shy away from that tension or those differences, and we confront them very candidly. So I think it's very complex. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it incorporates both of those elements. And I think candidly speaking, I think you could argue that our cooperation uh, and uh, our competition and uh, differences uh, with which we're confronted, uh, th those are also uh, growing simultaneously. Uh, to your second question, I would say, look, during the Cold War, there was much made of the construct of a triangle or a triad, and a lot of international relations uh, theory PhDs were written on the kinds of questions that you're posing. Uh, look, uh, both China and the United States uh, have uh, bilateral relations with uh, Russia. Uh, we are each engaging on a on a, on a set of uh, issues and a problem set. Some uh, are a function of sharing a border. Some are a function of uh, strong opposition to the violation of borders. The trilateral relationships, uh, though, throughout the Asia-Pacific region uh, clearly are emerging as a new and flexible form of political geometry, and I think that uh, one of the hallmarks of the last eight years has been the very significant progress that uh, has been made, certainly from the U.S.'s perspective, in our uh, trilateral work uh, with uh, Japan and Australia, with Japan and uh, the Republic of Korea, and in, in other combinations, and we certainly believe that there are f more opportunities in the region uh, to be developed through uh, that kind of plurilateral or minilateral uh, engagement, as well as in the important uh, platform of the East Asia Summit, where uh, the United States, uh, China, 
and Russia are all represented. So we maybe have time for two more questions. Let's go to the middle and the side, please. And then we'll go to New York. Thank you. Martin Rizincek with the Czech Television. I have two questions for whomever wants to pick them up. Um, the first is on TPP. What is going to be the President's message to his Asia partners, um, given the difficulties that only he, but it, is facing on the Hill here in, in the States? And the other question is, uh, would a potential failure of TPP negatively impact the talks on TTIP with, with Europe? Um, especially in the light of the latest remarks coming from Germany and France saying that the, the talks have, in effect, uh, failed. So, to put it more bluntly, is TTIP dead? Thank you. So maybe I can start and then um, Danny and, and Dan can jump in. So, I think when it comes to TPP, the administration has said that this is our number one legislative priority at this moment. I think we've been very clear that we intend to, we believe that the TPP agreement has potential benefits for us economically in terms of opportunities for U.S. businesses, U.S. workers, U.S. jobs. We think it has a benefit in the foreign policy realm. It very much is a hallmark and part of our strategy of a rebalance towards Asia. Um, and so I think we've been very clear that we are going to work to try to get this over the line with Congress, and we're confident that by making that case we can get there. So, so I would emphasize that our, our view is that we're going to push to get this done and we're, we are not giving up on TPP in any way and that's the message the President will deliver to partners in Asia. Um, on TTIP, I have information from our negotiating teams that are on the ground from as recently as today. The work is ongoing. The President has given a mandate to the negotiators to close negotiations this year. That is the what they are working on. And we've heard various press statements, you know, negotiations aren't closed until they're closed and, and there's often um, things said around negotiations that, that may or may not reflect the, the state of play, at least from our perspective. What we are hearing back from our team is that we're continuing to work through a number of thorny issues, um, and they're continuing to, to do the work the President's asked them to do, which is to conclude by, by the end of the administration, in the end of this year. Could I just underscore that and just to, to say, if, if you want, uh, just one recent, but I think powerful example of the President speaking to both the economic and the strategic importance of TPP and his commitment to getting the deal done uh, is look at the, uh, I think, very successful press conference that the President held with Singapore Prime Minister Li Xianlong during uh, the Prime Minister's official state visit here. I think the President was eloquent and forceful uh, on the issue and couldn't have been more clear. Just to underscore Christina's message. Yeah, let's go to New York, please, and then one last one back here. I have two questions uh, concerning the G20. The first is G20 and migration. In a letter sent to the leader of the G20, the President of the European Council and the European Commission asked the G20 to put the migration issue at the center of the discussion. What do you expect? What do you think the G20 could do in order to address this issue? The second is a question related to the uh, Apple issue that uh, today uh, uh, was uh, yeah, at the core of the discussion in, in Europe. Do you think that the issue of uh, tax inversion uh, could be one of the uh, issues that will be discussed at the uh, leaders' level at the G20, I mean, of course, the, the European Union and uh, the United States? So I can take both of those, and, and certainly if others want to jump in. So in terms of the migration issues, clearly this is an issue that is of utmost priority for the administration. It's an issue that is um, received very high level of attention um, in the co context of current challenges. At the G20, there have been discussions in multiple tracks and multiple work streams already on migration, and we expect that that will be something that continues during the summit. I think the G20 is the premier forum for discussing economic cooperation, and there are many many aspects of the migration challenges that we face that have a, an economic angle, in particular when it comes to the response to the refugee crisis that we are seeing, not only in, in Europe but also in other regions of the world. I think recent events have highlighted the need to have a more stable and a, a more durable system that provides support for countries that are hosting refugees, that helps to transition from humanitarian assistance to long-term development assistance, that helps to make the global system more resilient to these challenges in the future. So 
G20 leaders will discuss how do we move that agenda forward. There has already been a call in the finance ministers and central bank governors' discussions and in their public statements for the World Bank to look at the role that they might play in that space. Um, so I expect that, that this will be a topic of discussion. And of course, for this administration and for, for many countries around the world, we're also looking forward to a summit that the President will host on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly on refugees and migration. And we see the G20 as a good place to have a discussion that, that can continue into the sidelines of, of UNGA in, later in September. On the tax issues, as you, you're probably aware, tax and, and financial transparency, um, base erosion and profits shifting are issues that the G20 has really championed in the entire history since 2009. I think we will continue to see leaders lift up the work that's ongoing in the context of the OECD work on base erosion and profit shifting. We will continue to see a focus on, on what more can be done to, to increase um, transparency when it comes to tax and, and look at how do we move those issues forward in the G20 context. So I think you can definitely expect to see tax issues on the agenda for this year's summit. We Let's take the, excuse me, we'll take the last question from here, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency. Uh, I'm wondering what would be the style of the bilateral meeting between President Obama and President Xi. It would be similar to that in Sunnyland and Zhongnanhai, or it would be a relatively formal meeting between the two leaders. And secondly, how the Taiwan issue will be discussed in the bilateral meeting, uh, particularly considering uh, the situation that the cross-strait relations is in stalemate, and uh, this will be the last opportunity for the two leaders f uh, to have a lengthy discussion before President Obama steps on. Thank you. Well. Thank you very much for your question. <clears throat> On the style of the meeting, look, uh, here's, here's what I anticipate. I anticipate that uh, President Obama and President Xi will have the opportunity to sit down for uh, multiple hours to have a conversation. Uh, I anticipate, based on the model of uh, past meetings, that um, th there will both be uh, an expanded uh, meeting to talk about broader issues with a, a broader number of senior officials in the room. There will probably be a smaller restricted meeting to talk uh, uh, about some uh, of the more uh, difficult issues in the relationship. And then we anticipate that they'll have a discussion over dinner as well. Uh, whether or not there may be some informal element to the program, uh, we'll look forward to see what uh, you know, our, our Chinese uh, hosts have in mind. But the, 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 the main uh, priority, obviously, will be to ensure that our two leaders have enough time uh, to have a very substantive and, and strategic conversation. Uh, on, on the question of, of Taiwan, um, certainly, we've we've addressed that subject here uh, many times before, and as I've said here before, I anticipate uh, certainly that the cross-strait relations and the issue of Taiwan will will be discussed because uh, it, it always is, and at a minimum, uh, I'm sure that our, our Chinese friends will will raise the issue. Uh, on that occasion, uh, and as the, the president has always done uh, in his meetings with the Chinese leadership, the president will underscore our commitment to our One China policy based on both the three joint communiques and the Taiwan Relations Act. He'll emphasize that the U.S. national interest is uh, in seeing the continuance of stability uh, across the strait. And, and I think that uh, the President will also underscore the importance of ensuring uh, that as that stability is maintained, um, that, that uh, both sides take steps to contribute to that stability. Uh, and so I, I think it will be uh, very straightforward, um, uh, as it has been in the past. May I Please. just add two points Please. to that? Um, one is that the, the position and the message of the United States in response to what we hear from Beijing on Taiwan isn't a function of who the leader is in uh, Taiwan. It's a function of our our policy and our principles, and as Dan said, uh, encouraging the promotion of stable cross-strait uh, relations in a manner that benefits and respects uh, the wishes of people on both sides of the strait it remains a high priority. Um, but secondly, uh, we 
always encourage uh, the uh, expansion of Taiwan's international space and its ability to participate in a constructive way in organizations that don't require statehood uh, as a condition for membership uh, or in other appropriate f uh, formats because we know that uh, the people of Taiwan have a lot to contribute, have a lot to give, and that's true certainly in economic terms, and we see that at APEC. It's also true in uh, terms of security and safety and health and a wide range of issues, including law enforcement, where we think the contribution of uh, the people of Taiwan uh, is and should be welcome. Thanks. Quick follow-up. So, <clears throat> Hey, we quick follow. Please. Will, will, will the president lobby uh, President Xi on Taiwan's behalf in terms of Taiwan's participation in the account meeting that's coming up? Uh, let me just reiterate what I said before. I think uh, um, I anticipate the president will have an opportunity to reiterate our longstanding position on, on cross-strait relations and, and, and what that means for both sides of the strait and the maintenance of that, that peace and stability. And uh, there are a number of elements to that, but I'm, I'm confident that that will be the core of his presentation and the discussion between the two leaders. Okay. That, that concludes our briefing. We need to let our uh, briefers go. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.